now look to Sir Malcolm Rifkin to open the case for the opposition. Thank you, Mr. President. It's uh, my privilege to begin, if I may, by welcoming those who are speaking in favour of the motion. And we've just heard from Mr. Chris uh, Zabilovic. And I, as I listened to him, I was rather puzzled as to why he was actually proposing the motion, because most of it was some pretty bitter criticism of Russian policy. But I realised during the course of the evening that I knew the answer. I understand in the near future, he is not only going to become, or likely to become, the president-elect of this union, but we know that now because he's going to be unopposed. So that obviously makes him very sympathetic uh, to the <laughs> president. He clearly has more in common with the president of Russia than any of us realized until now. Uh, the second speaker for the motion is Mr. Yevgeny Chivarkin, and uh, I'm sure we all welcome him to, I think this is your first visit uh, to the Oxford uh, Union. Uh, Mr. Chivarkin is a Russian entrepreneur. Uh, he's probably wealthier than all of us combined, and that's uh, something we can only be envious of. But I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I think I can say with safety he's a good oligarch. Uh, because we know that he has been campaigning against corruption and he has the real mark of dignity that he has been tried in absentia uh, because of his opposition to the Russian government. I speak as someone currently banned from Russia, uh, so we share together, <laughs> we share together that badge of pride. And finally, someone who I've known for many years, uh, Sir Tony Brenton, who of course, is a very distinguished ambassador. It was once said that ambassadors are people who can be disarming, especially when their countries are not. <laughs> uh, it has already been pointed out that there are several knights of the realm here, two on our side, and of course, uh, Tony Brenton is also uh, a knight of, uh, of, uh, of St. Michael and St. George. Uh, when I was knighted, I remember uh, being approached by one of my colleagues who said, you do appreciate that once a knight is not enough. Think, think about that. <laughs> Takes time to sink in, I know, but never mind. <laughs> now, let us turn to the motion before us, which is whether, uh, whether we're treating Russia unfairly. And let me begin by saying, because I'm going to say some pretty critical things, but let me begin by saying that, of course, the Russia today is not as bad as the old Soviet Union, a totalitarian communist state. I was uh, Minister of State at the Foreign Office, uh, dealing with Russia under Margaret Thatcher. I was there when Mr. Gorbachev came to check us and met Mrs. Thatcher. He was a good guy. He actually helped end the Cold War without a shot being fired. And I have enormous admiration for him. But the old Soviet Union was absolutely dreadful, and it collapsed because communism failed. It totally failed. It was said that uh, communism only worked either in heaven, where they did not need it, uh, or in hell, where they had it already. <laughs> On one occasion, a British diplomat, a British ambassador visiting Moscow, uh, was addressing a Soviet audience in the bad old days when the Soviet economy was in a very poor state. He was speaking in English, and it had to be translated into Russian. And at one stage, he used the famous biblical phrase, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He heard that that was translated into Russian, as we have lots of vodka, but we're rather short of meat. <laughs> Now, the issue that we're discussing is whether we're treating Russia unfairly, the modern Russia, today's Mr. Putin's Russia, whether we're treating it unfairly. And let me begin by acknowledging, yes, I think if you go back in the years since the end of the Cold War, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, I think there are some legitimate criticisms of the way the West as a whole, and NATO in particular, treated Russia. There was a sort of triumphalism that we won the Cold War. And yes, in one sense, we did win the Cold War, but we would not have won it uh, if uh, modern Russia had not won it as well. It was a war that ended communism, and I said a few moments ago, Mr. Gorbachev and his colleagues uh, can be seen as heroes of the world. He did more than anyone else, because he not only enabled communism to disappear and the Soviet Union to disappear, but the captive states of Eastern Europe were given their freedom with virtually no shot being fired. And who would ever have predicted that the Cold War would come to an end so peacefully? So I think the triumphalism of the West is a legitimate criticism. Uh, 
I believe the attack on, Kosovo, on Serbia over the Kosovo issue, I personally have always thought, was a mistake. I don't have time to go into the reasons for that. Uh, and I think also uh, there should have been a little bit more sensitivity, not about Poland or Hungary or the Baltics joining NATO, but certainly about the question of Ukraine uh, joining uh, as a possibility of joining NATO. That could be, have been treated more sensitively at the time. So I think there are some criticisms. But I'm afraid set against what Russia under Mr. Putin has done in the recent past. Uh, and it is quite obvious uh, that the... Uh, burden of responsibility for the terrible aggression against Ukraine, for the thousands of people who've been killed, for the instability and forced division of that country is of a dreadful order. Because what have we actually uh, seen? Well, the starting point is why has it happened? And there's been two grievances that Mr. Putin has had against the West, and he's been quite open about it on various occasions. Uh, he seems to hold us responsible for the very collapse of the Soviet Union itself as a state, because it wasn't just the end of communism, it wasn't just the end of the Cold War. The Soviet Union disintegrated into 16 new countries. And of course, it wasn't the Soviet Union, it was the Russian Empire. And Mr. Putin has said that that was the greatest geopolitical disaster of his life. Not the end of communism, but the end of basically the Russian Empire. But we weren't responsible for that. Not only did NATO not expect it to happen, but when it looked likely that Ukraine would become independent, President Bush, the first President Bush, actually went to Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, and tried to persuade the Ukrainian parliament not to go for independence. Because we were very worried that Ukraine at that time had nuclear weapons, and who knew might, who, who might rule Ukraine? And we preferred them to be under Gorbachev or Yeltsin or someone like that, who was more reliable. In fact, so upset were the Ukrainians uh, being discouraged for going for independence <laughs> that President Bush's speech has been known ever since as the Chicken Kiev speech. Uh, and, <laughs> and they, of course, rejected his uh, advice. And it is simply not good enough to say that somehow, because many of the countries have joined NATO, that that was somehow an argument of Western perfidy. The question has to be asked, why did Poland, Hungary, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, why have they all been desperate to join NATO? If they had seen Mr. Putin's Russia as a friend to their future and to their aspirations, they would have had no interest in joining the Western alliance. They might have wanted to join the European Union, but the reason why they were desperate to join NATO was because they saw Mr. Putin as still not genuinely recognizing their independence. Now, what has happened in the last few years? And it's been pretty disgraceful when you think about it and when you're being asked to consider whether we've treated Russia fairly or unfairly. We've had the annexation of Crimea. Now, Crimea, the annexation, without any consultation with the Ukrainian government, with a bogus referendum that took about a week to hold, with no opposition allowed on television or in the press against the outcome of that referendum. Do you know the last time on ethnic grounds, because that was the argument, these are Russians who are being persecuted, it was alleged by the Ukrainian government, they have to be brought into the Russian Federation. Do you know the last time that argument was used? The Sudetenland in 1938, when it was alleged that the uh, German-speaking uh, residents of the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia uh, were being maltreated, it was alleged by Hitler. Now, I don't claim Putin's another Hitler, he's not, but there is this particular comparison which is deeply disturbing. It is the last time the territory in Europe since 19... The first time, I'm sorry, the first time since 1945 that territory in Europe has been annexed by another European country on bogus grounds relating to the ethnicity uh, of the residents uh, of a particular territory. And that is hugely dangerous. But there's an additional reason why it is unforgivable. It is alleged by Mr. Putin and by his colleagues uh, that, well, Crimea should never have been part uh, of Ukraine. It's Russian speaking. It was only some idiot decision by Khrushchev uh, many, many years ago that linked it to Ukraine. Well, whatever the history of that may be, that doesn't get him out of this particular problem. Because after the Russian Federation came into existence, after the Soviet Union had disappeared, the Russian government, not the old Soviet one, the Russian government signed what is known as the Budapest Memorandum. And that was the agreement that persuaded Ukraine to hand over the nuclear weapons that, because of the old Soviet Union, were stationed in their territory. They could have held on to them, and we were all very worried that they might. 
they handed these nuclear weapons over to the Russians. Some of them were destroyed, and Ukraine ceased to be a nuclear power. And as part of that agreement, Russia signed a, the Budapest Memorandum in which they recognized the territorial integrity, the existing borders of Ukraine, with Crimea. And when that was uh, ignored, trampled on, by the forced annexation of Crimea, that was not only grossly unfair to the people of Ukraine, it also did massive damage to the non-proliferation treaty with regard to the spread of nuclear weapons. Here you had a country that had voluntarily given up its nuclear weapons in exchange for a treaty commitment and now finding its territory annexed. One can only ask whether the Russians would have dared to do that if Ukraine had still had nuclear weapons as North Korea has today. So it was a hugely dangerous step and an extremely foolish one. The final points I want to make is to try and share with you some explanation as to why Putin behaves like that. Because in some ways, to be fair to him, he's not some new type of Russian leader. He is part of a Russian empire which goes back to Peter the Great, which has believed for hundreds of years, sadly, that the only way Russia can be secure is by controlling the territory immediately around it. And that was why the history of Russia has been to expand into non-Russian territories and why the old Soviet Union inherited from the Tsars was a huge empire spreading across the whole Eurasian landmass. Now, of course, there was the British Empire, there was the French Empire. Somebody said the difference was quite simple. Britain had an empire, Russia was an empire. And although Gorbachev and Yeltsin were modern enough to realize that that was no longer sustainable, Putin does not accept that. He knows he cannot reincorporate all these territories back into Russia. And I don't suppose he'd even want to if he could because he knows uh, it would be more trouble than it's worth. But what he is trying to do with Ukraine and with the Baltics if he was allowed is to control their destiny, to tell them what are the limits of their independence. Now, in history, there have been other countries that have tried that. The Americans used to have the Monroe Doctrine. Stay out of Latin America. That's our backyard. You're, nobody else except us are allowed to interfere and tell the Latin Americans. That stopped with Fidel Castro. Cuba did not submit to that, and the Americans learned that lesson. And for the last 40 years, they have not tried anything uh, of that order. So I conclude by saying that uh, Mr. Putin is the last leader of any major country that seeks to control the territory and limit the political choices uh, of their neighboring states. Until he drops that foolish view, then far from being treated unfairly by the international community, he has to be constantly reminded. He has to have the severest political and economic and diplomatic pressure put upon him in order to ensure that countries which for the first time, sometimes in their history, and certainly for many years, are enjoying political liberty and the rule of law, that they should be allowed not only to enjoy those freedoms, but be allowed to determine for themselves in Ukraine, in the Baltic states, in Georgia, uh, the political destiny that they think is appropriate to their own people. At this moment in time, Mr. Putin does not accept that view, and therefore, far from being treated unfairly, he's being treated in exactly the way he deserves. I invite you to oppose this motion.